How's it guys, it's MJ, and this is going to be another raw, unedited video surrounding finance. So, the last video we spoke about tax. What we're going to be doing in this video is looking at central banks. So, this is point number three on the syllabus, and that is to demonstrate a knowledge of the influence from central banks over the commercial and economic environment. So, let's get into it. What do we mean by commercial banks. Oh, sorry, not commercial banks, central banks. What do we mean by central banks? And like I said, this is raw, this is unedited, this is heavily my opinion, this is me studying out loud, so feel free to disagree with what I say in the comment section below. Um, like I said, not everything here is going to be factual, it's me talking to myself as I try to uh, grapple with these concepts. And what I like to do when I study finance is be very skeptical and challenge all the material that we are presented with. So, for instance, the first thing we're told is that central banks are independent. And I think that is absolute rubbish. So we're told that central banks are independent from government. And why I say that is rubbish is that when you look at who is on who's in control of the central bank, you see that they're appointed by the government. They meet regularly with the government, and the government sets the goals for them to achieve. They have independence around how they achieve that. But it's almost like the government is outsourcing it, but tells them what to do, but says, you know what, guys, do it however you want. And what do they do? Well, they're going to be looking after something known as monetary policy. Now, monetary policy, you'll remember from your economic days, is the sister policy to something known as fiscal policy. Now, fiscal policy deals with, uh, you know, tax and government spending and um, all those type of things. Monetary policy deals primarily with the money supply. And... I mean, this is where you can get a lot of economic debate. Which one's more important, monetary supply or fiscal policy? This is where you start entering, you know, who's a better economist, Keynes or, you know, Milton Friedman. You know, there's a lot of arguing and debating that you can do around these topics. However, for the, the meaning of the actuarial exams, you, we need to know what is their influence over the economic environment. So I'm not going to try to get too bogged down in, in all this type of stuff, but rather focus more on like the theory that we need to know. So one thing, let me maybe find some more, some more space over here, is let's look at what is their goal. Okay, what is the primary goal of the central bank? The central bank wants a very simple aim, and that is sustainable economic growth sustainable economic growth that's their aim so that's that's important keep that at the back of your mind this is what the central bank wants so it's actually it's been set up for this is a good noble thing it's good to have uh, sustainable economic growth and how they try to achieve this, or specifically the South African Reserve Bank or Central Bank, is they think that they can achieve sustainable economic growth through price stability. Okay, so they, they kind of take the stance that if everything is stable, stability, um, you know, if everything is stable, is vol if volatility is reduced, then that creates the perfect environment for economic growth um, and how they're trying to achieve price stability is they want to keep inflation under control so they believe they can achieve price stability by keeping inflation um, under control and it's interesting is and I mean we're seeing this a little bit in Europe is inflation was too low and that becomes a problem if inflation is too high it's also a problem if inflation fluctuates, it's also a problem. So inflation is quite a weird thing, um, but it's something that we want to keep under control. We want the money supply to steadily increase in a very predictable manner because that creates a very nice economic 
growth uh, opportunities and it's sustainable. Key word there is sustainable. We want, we'd rather have our economy grow 5% every single year um, than 10% one year, 3% the next year, 20%. You know, we don't want that, that volatility. We want stability. Okay, so we want sustainable economic growth. We feel like we can achieve that by having uh, price stability. We achieve price stability by keeping inflation under control. How do you keep inflation under control? Well, you manipulate the interest rates. I don't think I should use the word manipulate. That's got a bit of negative connotations. Um, they say control the interest rate. Okay, so now th there's other monetary uh, policies and other instruments that the, the central banks can use to achieve you know, a sustainable economic growth. But the main one that they're going to do is they're going to fluctuate the interest rates. And that makes it very interesting because when you start changing interest rates, you start changing the economic environment. You start changing risk appetite, you start changing investors' behavior, and this can cause a lot of, I don't want to say chaos, but it can, it can change a lot of things. It can shake up an economy by changing your interest rates. And when an interest rate changes, the price of all assets also change. And they don't all change in the same ratio, which means it introduces a lot of opportunities for asset managers to make a lot of profit or to make a lot of loss. So, but this is their goal. This is their goal, is they want sustainable economic growth. Yes, it might have some undesired consequences when they change the interest rate, because they're going to change the interest rate to target inflation. But when you change interest rate, it also changes a whole bunch of other things. And... The thing is, they don't want to necessarily do that because they are accountable to government. If the central bankers stuff up, the government will appoint other central bankers. So that's why, like I said, they say it's independent. I'm not buying into that. I think it's maybe independent by, you know, just just window dressing. They, they do want to, like, have the, the mirage of independence because then the central, uh, sorry, then the credit rating agencies will give them a better ranking. So where's independence? We do want to pretend that we're independent for the credit rating agencies. They'll give us a better score if we're independent, but we're going to reach into these guys much later on. That's another crazy story altogether, is uh, the credit rating agencies, because if they give your country a bad rating, then you, it could dry up foreign investment completely and cause your country to go into a recession. So these guys have a lot of power. So it's very good to impress them by pretending to be independent, but you're not really independent when the government is appointing the directors or the majority of the directors to the central bank. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a bit of a weird, I mean, the credit ratings agencies know that, but it's, it's all smoke and mirrors um, around that stuff. Anyway, let's get into some of the other things that the central bank um, is involved in that we need to know for our actuarial exams. Okay, central banks, I mean, one way I like to think about them is that they're the bank to the banks. So they're dealing a lot with banking uh, regulations. All other regulations or financial regulations in South Africa are controlled by the FSB. They, they will go, like, so pensions, insurance, um, all those type of guys, they come under the, the Financial Service Board, but banking and, funnily enough, pyramid schemes are regulated by the central bank. Okay, so they do banking regulations. And, I mean, one of the big things with regulations is they tell them, you know, what, what type of reserves they should hold. So, remember, when you go and you deposit, say, 100 rand into a bank, the bank will keep, say, 10 rand as their reserve, and they'll take 90 rand of your money and lend it to somebody else. Okay, which in a weird way kind of means that the net total is you have 100 rand, this other person on the street has 90 rand, so there's now 190 rand. 90 rand just got created. That person goes and puts it in the bank again, the bank will keep 9 rand and lend out 81 rand uh, type of vibe. So the banking regulation sets the reserve limit, and they could say 10%. Um, you know, that's the reserve you should hold when you do your fractional lending or something like that. 
So they'd say what reserves you should hold um, and give a little bit on, you know, what's the capital adequacy and all that type of stuff, which we also need to know about and we'll come back to later on in yeah, videos way down the line. Um, so yeah, they do banking regulations. They also implement government borrowing. So if the government wants to issue a bond or um, you know, needs to raise money, they will do it through the central bank. The central bank can therefore buy and sell securities. Okay, they buy and sell securities. And I mean, when they, when they buy back securities, they're pumping money into the system. When they're selling securities, they're absorbing money and they're controlling the money supply. Um, so this is like another technique that they can use to, say, control inflation. Like I said, interest rate control is their main one, but they can do a whole bunch of other things um, to control the money supply. So yeah, government uh, borrowing, they also want to make sure that the performance and integrity of the financial markets is in check, although that is something that in South Africa falls sometimes with the Financial Service Board, you know, how stocks, who can list and all that type of stuff. Um, they also do intervention in currency markets. Oops. Currency markets. I mean, the big central bank, well, they're, they're not called a central bank in China. They, they're known as more as a national bank. But it gets very interesting around, you know, the currency market and how they, you know, do certain things in order to keep the, the value of their currency quite low to encourage exports and, and all that type of stuff. So that is one of the, the things central banks can do is that they can, they can get involved in currency markets. Also, I mean, currency is linked to interest rates. I mean, if you have a very high interest rate, then foreign investors are going to be attracted to your currency or securities in your currency's name because, you know, you're going to get quite a nice interest rate return. And that's going to fuel demand for uh, securities in your currency's denomination. So interest rates, like I said, they impact inflation, but they can also impact uh, currency markets, which then impacts exports and imports, which can impact um, unemployment and, you know, factories and, uh, you know, different industries. Like I said, it gets very complicated, the central bank stuff, how by changing one thing, it can have these ripple effects throughout the economy. Um, other thing that they do is they do the, the minting of notes and coins. Uh, minting notes and coins. So they, they literally make money. Like they go in and they take paper, they take some ink, they slap it together, they've printed money. And I mean, that's quite a cool, quite a cool job is to literally um, make money. Now, the extent of involvement will depend on the division of power. So depending on what country you are, you know, this independence, some countries are more independent than others. Um, you know, what is the power between the central bank, the government and other regulatory bodies? Like I said, in South Africa, we do have the FSB as well. But I mean, like I said, there, there's a lot to be said around central banks. There's a lot of law. I mean, especially in, say, the European Union, their central bank has got quite a different role to, say, the South African central bank. So you could almost dedicate your life to just studying central banks. And I actually want to just end this video off with, um, so while I was doing reading on this topic, I came across this guy called, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, so we're going to just call him Walter. Walter... I don't know how to say that. How do you say that, that name? Bag, bagger hot? I don't know. Um, I'm terrible with pronunciation. These funny English names. Um, and Walter was quite a, an interesting guy. Um, he married a girl whose father started The Economist magazine, uh, which I actually read. And I would recommend you guys also read that, that magazine. Um, you know, just to keep up to date with what, what's happening in the world. Although it's quite a pessimistic magazine. A lot of like report on a lot of bad things happening in the world. Um, anyway, he, he influenced central banks in the sense that it was his idea or he gave the advice that central banks should lend to other banks to bail them out. So he came up with the whole idea of the bailout plan. Now, I mean, this guy is, he died in 1877 and they were quoting him in 2007 with the, the world recession and stuff. 
So he kind of put forward the idea that the central bank should be a lender of last resort in order to you know, keep the, the economy from falling flat on its, flat on its face. Um, but finally, just to end off this video, I was reading through some of his quotes and his, um, one of them, he's got quite a lot of funny quotes, uh, very much tongue in cheek. But the one that he said, which I thought was quite interesting, coming to central banks and stuff like that and these organizations, is he says, the whole history of civilization is strewn with creeds and institutions which were invaluable at first and deadly afterwards. And what I find interesting about this quote is a lot of these organizations or things that we set up, we set them up with great intentions. You know, central bank's going to keep the economy stable. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. It's going to keep unemployment down, inflation in check, all this type of stuff. But when you start putting in these organizations with their regulations, there are some unforeseen consequences in the sense that it increases the barrier to entry and it kind of reduces the whole free market idea in the sense that not anyone can now just start operating a bank. To get a banking license is very difficult, which means people who already have banking licenses can set quite a high price for you know, banking fees and you don't want that in a free market. Although you don't want the alternative where you have a whole bunch of scammers running around hustling everybody. And I mean, so that's why there was a need for central banks uh, because of that. But it does have some negative consequences. Anyway, that's, um, that is the central bank. The, the big thing to realize, the big thing to realize is this part over here where they can influence the interest rates. And by changing the interest rates, they can change the whole economic environment. So if you're into you know, trading and buying stocks and all that type of stuff, or you're a speculator or you're a big asset manager, what you can always do is whenever an event happens, you can think to yourself, maybe let's draw it very quickly here. So an event happens. You can think, how will the central bank react to this? Okay, so a random event happens. This event is random. Um, the central bank, bank reacts, but they will be in a very predictable way. Because remember, they've stated what their aim is, and that is to keep prices stable. So they're going to change interest rates in a certain way to combat whatever event it was. Because interest rates are changing, there's going to be a change in asset prices, which you could almost predict. So you can know, okay, this random event happens, central banks are going to increase interest rates to prevent that, which is actually going to cause uh, these various assets to also go up and these various assets to go down. You short sell those assets, you buy the other assets, and once the central bank makes their decision, congratulations, you've actually made a lot of money. Um, although I must say people who have implemented the strategy in the past have mis misread how the central bank would react or central banks may only lower interest rates or change interest rates much later and then you know there's the whole liquidity um, of their position that starts taking strain and you know it gets a little bit more complicated than that but the general idea is that if you understand the central banks very very well you can make a lot of money um, through investments and speculations in the stock market and the various other asset classes. So they are an important player. And, um, but yeah, there's a lot of rules, regulations, litigation, and all the stuff that goes behind them. But at the end of the day, remember that they want to sustain economic growth. They want price stability. They want to keep inflation under control. And their main tool is changing the interest rate. Thanks guys so much for watching. And yeah, hit subscribe because I will be making a whole bunch of videos like this where they're raw, unedited, me just talking about the various things that we need to know in the syllabus for the fellowship exams of finance. Thanks guys for watching. Cheers.